Well, thanks, guys. I mean, that's um, we've had a, a real tour de force through everyone's experience, and I hope that set the scene for everyone who's watching. And I'd like to just remind everyone, please do use the chat box. Um, I mean, it's all been perfectly explained, I know, but it must have generated some questions or queries. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to go back to where I began with Junaid, and I think you we talked about it briefly, but acute termination i mean when you see that happen it's a wonderful thing but how important do you think it is when we're trying to ablate afib with the acumap system should we just keep going until the af stops or and what does it mean when it happens so um i guess this is could be an entirely separate session in itself uh, in terms of the length of answer um i we probably all the viewers will know that there's still yet to be any long-term outcome procedural clinical benefit from those patients who acutely terminate or be i will preface that by um referencing our meta-analysis that I, uh, the stanford group and i published in 2018 that showed that when you pooled all the af driver mapping studies uh, about 3200 patients including the very notable negative ones that showed no benefit actually there was a soft predisposition to uh, af freedom at 12 months from acute termination uh, mechanistically, it's a very uh, important finding because it, it, it demonstrates you've interrupted the fibrillatory process. Um, the issues are whether that is a cumulative impact of sequential pr procedures that you've done in the chamber or a remote to the chamber, or it is actually the direct impact of that ablation on the lesion and driver uh, at that time. The, uh, the mode of termination is also important because actually, um, from again early experience with the Tapera system, many of these terminations occurred not via a transitory atrial tachycardia, but direct to sinus rhythm, and that's something that conceptually I think people found difficult to initially get their heads around because you would imagine a a, a core ablation would anchor an atrial tachycardia to the site of a previously spinning rotational activation or a um, or or or, a, or anchor a local irregular activity to a AT, but that wasn't the case. Actually, some of these are direct terminations to sinus rhythm. And, and I think uh, where the field is currently going in terms of AF driver mapping is to explain how that is possible and why that is probably a different group of patients and a different subject area to the ones who terminate via traditional atrial tachycardia mechanisms. So I think it is important. I wouldn't you know, spend six hours chasing termination outside of a specific research context if that was your hypothesis. Uh, but when it does happen, it seems to be uh, an important indicator that the fibrillation is slightly different to the uh, to the average persistent AF case. Yeah, no, I think, and, and, yeah, I think in my own experience as well, it's probably it's probably about fifty fifty of either organising into a stable arrhythmia or just going straight from AF to sinus rhythm. And we've also had that same experience of a delay. Um, you know, we've had some patients who've just terminated while we've been analysing a map. So we haven't, you know, we finished our ablation five minutes earlier and then we were looking for new targets. Um, we've had one person terminate as we were charging up the defibrillator to 200 joules to shock them because we decided we'd done enough. So, um, yeah, so I think we're definitely addressing the mechanisms but how we're doing that and there's still a lot to learn so if i could just add a little bit of a uh, end note to that um the analogy i use uh is the smoke and fire analogy you have put out the fire with your ablation of the driver but there is enough stochastic occurrence of fibrillatory wavelets in the atrium which is probably a size dependent phenomenon to mean that they don't collide with a, a non-collective boundary and extinguish themselves and we've had some terminations, albeit delayed by hours, which you could mechanistically attribute to the uh, fact you've done a drive ablation. So it's kind of you put the fire out, but there's still smoke circulating in the room, and that takes a, a, a certain amount of time to extinguish. And in some patients, the vast majority, it never extinguishes, hence you get AF rumbling on. But, but it's very much a, uh, an interesting mechanistic discussion as to how, how the driver trigger substrate model works. Now, Bearing all that in mind, I'm going to move to Sarah and ask you about your workflow, because, you know, some people might be thinking, gosh, these are going to be extremely long cases. Um, or are we actually making the cases quicker? So tell me just a little bit about the impact of, of, uh, of using this approach in your lab. Yeah, I think um, certainly it varies a little bit, um, but I, as my case showed earlier, uh, I think overall 
once you get um, uh, used to the interpreting the system, because I think there is a, a little bit of a learning curve when you start to do your first few cases, uh, I think the end result eventually is you end up doing much less ablation than you would have previously. Um, you know, I was uh, a heavy ablator, if you will, I, I, in addition to the veins. I did extensive posterior wall isolation, and I'm not doing as much of that now um, with uh, with Acumap. Uh, it's much more focused, um, and as, as, as my case showed, um, th that particular patient, I did much less ablation than I would have uh, normally done. So I think after um, you get your... Um, you, know, you get used to interpreting the system and, and the maps after the first few cases. I think actually uh, in the long term, you uh, the cases are shorter. Um, you know, the, the duration of the procedure is shorter. Um, the time the patient's under anesthesia is shorter. All, all big advantages. Yes, you've got to compare it to what you, you would be doing otherwise. And that could be a whole series of linear lesions or uh, not just the do the PBI and get out. Exactly. Um, and now I was going to ask Mike a, a question, but actually something has popped up in the chat, which I think um, from it's certainly it's I think it's technically based, which you'll be in a good position to answer. So and I'm going to extend the question a bit as well. So this is a question about um, using pacing to assess uh, lip block or conduction through lines and then what it looks what those linear lesions look like during a fib. And now why is it that sometimes during a fib it might look like there are wave fronts crossing lines, but when you actually then cardiovert and do pacing, you show block. And I guess that might be a an opportunity to also talk about why it looks like when veins are isolated, there may be still conduction going into them. Sorry, that's quite a lot. Yes. Um, so I suppose the, the the first one, what do uh, lines um, look like in, in kind of assessing lines during a, AF and the crossover with what you see after PV isolation, I suppose is in some ways the same um, sort of question. Um, I think there are, there are a couple, two explanations for, for that. One is partly related to uh, analysis of, of charge density signals and amplitude of charge density signals. I, you know, the, the sort of physicists and, and engineers at Acutus would explain this sort of thing better than me, but um, the understanding of charge density amplitude, I think, is relatively in its, in its infancy. Um, and um, exactly the, the, the sort of threshold, if, if you like, is very sensitive. So we'll often and annotate activation in those zones, even where it, you know, uh, isn't because you, you can't necessarily set them because it, it sets that that threshold of amplitude uh, very low. But also the the inverse um, solution will try and uh, essentially uh, display activation, or or it, you know will solve for wherever the the, the anatomy uh, is. So. Um, it, it may sometimes show activation because the anatomy is there and you're trying to, you know, you're asking it to give a solution to the inverse problem. Um, but you, so you have to, during AF, take that, uh, bear that in mind. Um, and you, so you can't necessarily get a clear idea of, of block across linear lesions during AF. But you can, if you look over a, a, a long enough segment, you can get a good idea of how wave fronts uh, meet um linear lesions or or areas of block and you can generally get a reasonable um idea of, of whether a line is is blocked or not but it's definitely you know much better assessed in sinus rhythm dur during pacing and that's then using the supermap uh algorithm to 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 do that um i mean which the I super map is definitely it's it's much more focused isn't it we haven't really had talked much about super map because it's very much for stable rhythms and we've focused a lot on mapping a fib but yeah if you're trying to find the origin of a focal tachycardia or a gap in a line um or just a, a zone of slow conduction super map is going to be far more precise because it is literally layered beat upon beat upon beat and it will get rid of all the the noise around it whereas in AF you know it's a static map and of course remember sometimes when there's a, a line which is blocked in AF there are other ways that that each side can be activated epicardially or from two different wave fronts crossing over from right atrium to left atrium 
So it's all very chaotic, but you you get used to that as you as you draw as the eye draws you in. Um, so and I think one of the striking features was uh, of your case, Sarah, and also which we talked about earlier on was this this sort of area areas of irregular slow conduction and um, twisting and turning and wave break and affecting the velocities. So um, well. I was going to ask you, Mike, about what you thought about that, but I'm going to ask Junaid as well. Is is this something which, with the other mapping systems you have um, experience with, it, you know, would they have shown these sort of phenomena up, or were they much more focused on focal firing and drivers and rotors? Uh, so I'll kick off. Uh, I guess uh, no. If your um, if your pre-specified outputs are focal impulses and rotational circuits, then uh, the system will um, typically detect those and everything else is termed fibrillatory conduction. So from, um, from uh, experience with other systems that use a panoramic approach, you'd have lots of chaotic activity in the periphery, which would distinguish it from a typical flutter or a atypical flutter case, but they were um, uh, unable or had, I guess, no interest kind of in a research perspective or clinical to quantify or um, demarcate that. That's slightly evolved now with the fact that if, um, as we are seeing in the uh, Acumap literature, these are spatially stable sites, which seem to ac account for the vast majority, actually, of areas of, of interest, 60 to 70 percent in most series. And the question is, as, as it, what they mean and what to do about them. Uh, but I think this is the first systematic evaluation of the fibrillatory process uh, with a uh, number site and mechanism approach. And, and Sarah, did you find it hard to adapt your um, sort of mindset to what to uh, attack? I mean, tell me honestly, when you first started using the system, were you expecting rotors, <laughs> rotational activity or, you know, what did you expect and what did you find? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I wasn't sure what I would find when I first started. Um, and I think that um, I'm continuing to learn as I continue to use the system. Um, I think I'm finding areas of more areas of irregular activation than actual focal um, activation um, and less on the posterior wall in my experience, more anteriorly. That seems to be a very um, common area for areas of irregular activation. Um, and surprisingly, not as many areas as I thought I'd find. Um, on average, maybe uh, consistent with your data as well, maybe two to three, um, you know, and, and so uh, it's, it's helped me understand, you know, we have a lot to understand about the atrial substrate, but I think it's helped me to understand a lot. And I think I'm continuing to learn more as, as we do more cases with it. And, and Mike, you've probably looked at more maps than anybody and uh, literally, well, you're probably into the thousand mark now over, with hundreds of patients. Have you started to, in your own mind, categorize people into having different phenotypes of atrial fibrillation based upon the maps which you're seeing? And does that influence perhaps not either the strategies for ablation or the outcomes? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I've... Uh, as you say, yes, yeah, certainly um, in the hundreds of, of, of patients. Uh, and actually, that there definitely are different patterns, different overall phenotypes that you can pick out in the maps. And actually, that comes back to that that question of this, you know, on average, how many sites do, do, do you ablate? And yeah, in the, the literature, the kind of median, if you like, is say three, four, but the spread is quite, quite large. So you will see some patients with a phenotype that looks much more organized, perhaps focally driven, focal mechanisms from the veins, um, a first time persistent, you know, first time uh, patient. And actually pulmonary vein isolation, you know, is probably enough in those patients. And we know that pulmonary vein isolation is enough in a decent proportion of patients. And identifying that phenotype uh, that doesn't have lots of extra PV mechanisms I think is important so that you don't then deliver extra ablation that is perhaps um, potentially more harmful than beneficial. And then at the other end of the spectrum are those patients that actually have multiple 
mechanisms, a very chaotic looking overall phenotype, very little consistency in global activation. And it, I think it's those patients that will will often end up being the our longer cases. And these are perhaps the ones that give you a bit of a reputation in the lab. Potentially they'll redo, redo patients where we you know, will ablate multiple sites in the left atrium, then look at the right atrium and again ablate multiple sites. So you can definitely see, Pat, and in fact, if you look at um, our data set and the differences in activation patterns between first time patients and, and redo patients or patients who come into the lab in AF versus those who have uh, sustained sinus rhythm after a cardioversion, there are differences uh, in the, the overall activation patterns. And those with who, who come in in AF have uh, much more rotational activation and, and um, fewer focal activations, whereas those patients who you induce AF and actually patients with paroxysmal AF, we've done a few as part of research protocols in paroxysmal AF, and they're much more focally uh, driven mechanisms. So you definitely do see, um, you know, considerable differences between between these groups um, and actually some of that you know we talked about AF termination patients with that we induce uh, AF uh, in and those with more focal mechanisms tend to have a higher rate of, of AF termination um, and there is there certainly was some retrospective data from the star AF sort of group where those patients who come into the lab in sinus rhythm uh, had the best you know to better long-term uh, outcomes uh, and maybe you know, that that sort of talks to different phenotypes different sort of electrophysiological mechanisms potentially in these in these patients so i think um, i'm going to wind up by um asking you all a, a loaded question uh, so when um, you know if we do a an acumap case and we get a, maybe even termination to sinus rhythm but the patient has a recurrence um, is it a failure of the mapping or is it a failure of the ablation lesions and we but we put them in the right place but they didn't leave long-term transmural lesions do you think do you, in, in other words do you think um well i suppose i'll answer it myself or, is it not or the right atrium <laughs> Yeah, or 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 is it a, a you know an evolution in the the AF substrate itself? You know, it's a progressive disease. You know, it's um, uh, you know it's developing. It's it, extra cardiac um, influences. You know, whether you know uh, whether that's um, other morbidities, uh, etc. So it's poten you know potentially all of those things. Well, just as I was about to wind up, we've got a couple of in good questions. So I'm going to just push uh, the finish time back a little bit. So um, when you talked about your phenotypes, Mike, um, do you see that phenotype change? I suppose either periablation or the odd person who's come back maybe six months or 12 months later for a repeat procedure. Yeah, the, the the second of those, unfortunately, is harder to answer, answer um, because those who tend to have come back are those who, in the in the initial maps, have had very chaotic uh, looking substrates. Um, but the numbers that we've done repeat procedures with acutus and looked at the the maps systematically, it's probably difficult to draw, um, you know, strong conclusions uh, on that. Um, but you definitely During do. During the procedure, um, yeah, I mean, you, your, your left and right atrial balance, um, you know, we had you know, some examples there perhaps. Yeah, you definitely see changes dur during the procedure. So, you know, you'll see a more chaotic uh, phenotype initially, and sometimes you see more organisation just following pulmonary vein isolation. And sometimes you'll see more uh, organisation after um non-pulmonary vein uh, ablation and sometimes you'll you know you'll see some that, that really don't change they've got very chaotic sort of substrates um pulmonary vein isolation doesn't really change the the, the phenotype um so yeah you'll certainly you certainly see patients see changes following ablation and the, that, that the last question was do we think we'll see some randomized data uh, for long-term outcomes and i think you know that's as clinicians it's what we all 
always want to see, don't we, as the, the gold standard. Um, you know, it, these are expensive trials. They need a large number of patients. Um, and of course, we need to understand how to use the technology at its at its best. Um, so whether the trials should be which targets we should approach or whether it should be individualized acutus mapping versus an empiric approach. I mean, uh, Junaid, you used um, the box isolation and pulmonary vein isolation as the control in the um, propensity match studies. If we were to do a, a future randomized trial, what would you have as the control arm? Uh, I think you'd have to have pulmonary vein isolation. Just on it. Just on its own, I think, because of because, uh, despite all of what we've discussed in the last hour, I think the uh, the comparator has to be pulmonary vanization using contact force technology with modern deflectible sheaths in operators who are experienced. And as reaffirm showed, uh, the freedom from AF with that is probably in the mid 70s to 75 percent just by that. So therefore, your delta that you're going to have to demonstrate is going to need a big study with lots of arms and a very nuanced understanding of endpoints and discretionary ablation being discouraged. And then we have a clear endpoint. And as you said, Tim, it may not actually be the mapping itself. It might actually be the fact that your lesions are completely uh, non durable or as Mike said, the patient's got sleep apnea after the trial and suddenly do up the subject. So those are the pitfalls uh, of a RCT. But I think PVI has to be a comparator arm because it is actually the only thing that we know is demonstrated consistent outcomes and is getting better. And, and and Sarah, do you think that there could ever be a patient where it will show us we don't need to do pulmonary vein isolation, but actually the, you know, the substrate is outside of the pulmonary veins and actually targeting that? I mean, for our cases, we start with PVI, then we remap and then we target uh, non-PVI uh, um, phenomena. Do you think we should be doing it the other way around? Well, you know, there's always those cases that we bring to the lab, um, you know, longstanding persistent patients who, even though they haven't had a prior PVI, there's, there, you know, the veins are electrically quiet. And so I think there is um, a, a population of patients that perhaps, uh, you know, we target uh, non-pulmonary vein sites within the atrial substrate. I, I don't know if PVI will ever go away. I, I still think the majority of patients will require um PVI as part of their ablation strategy, but you know those there are that small group that uh, you, you take to the lab for the first time, and it, it ends up being all uh, non-PV uh, sources. Well, and we I'm need not... something, don't we, to anchor uh, our, our quarter boundary approach. We need something to anchor that too, <laughs> as well as the mitral annulus. Um, right. I, I think, I mean, we've gone over the hour. It's been a fantastic conversation. I mean, I could keep uh, chatting to you all, all night, um, but I'd, I'd very much like to thank you for all, all of you for your participation. I'd like to thank um, all of you who've tuned in to listen to the webinar. Um, thanks to uh, Cutus Medical for organising all of this and thanks to Wanda for hosting it. And I hope you all have a fantastic rest of the day.